the youth of our dear Ernest. Ernest, who would remember all his life the night of the 14th of April 1912, which was as cold as chilling. Certainly, it was the occasion of a well-known disaster, which is not to be discussed here, but it also marked a turning point in his exhausting factotum life. After a long day of polishing the crystal surfaces that would be used to quench the thirst and boredom of the RMS Titanic's first-class customers, Ernest had his hands nibbled by the vapors and droplets of scorching water. This is how he found himself at night on the deck of the ship before the fatal accident, for he was boiling inside. He couldn't stand it anymore, and his bruised hands were a good excuse to enjoy the chilly air outside, which would have stabbed you to the bones if you weren't covered enough. Something which would inevitably happen to many passengers just a few hours later. Feeling the icy wind whip his face and bare hands, Ernest was transported to a whole other time, a time he hardly regretted and preferred not to think about if he could avoid it. Only sometimes the past catches up with you and even the smallest seemingly insignificant detail can have the power of a tsunami of memories. This is how little Ernest found himself alone on the edge of the forest, soon lost, paralyzed by cold and fear, one night of 1879, after having behold the amok race of one of his neighbors on every member of his family. A murderous madness of which he was the only witness, but also the only survivor. That evening, he saw in Mr. Bodard's usually gentle eyes a bloodthirsty gaze inhabited by jealous and resentful madness. A very basely material lust, which then seemed incomprehensible to each of the inhabitants of the village. But in the end, no one was surprised or cared much for long afterwards. Ernest certainly escaped from it, but did not come out unscathed, far from it even. He had indeed just watched every sibling of his, as well as his parents, being killed one after the other with a sigh. These images of unspeakable violence would haunt him forever. Worse still, the smell of warm blood in the kitchen years later would never fail to bring him back to the place of horror and would make him faint inevitably. This would happen until his very last breath, decades after the massacre, the facts still pervading him as vividly. Fortunately for him, being quite short for his age, the boy was able to sneak up and hide during the carnage under a piece of furniture. And this, up until a villager passing by at summery dawn to go to the fields, was alerted by the hubbub in the house, usually very quiet at this time of day. Mr. Baudard was screaming and shouting in things unfathomable to the same, madness having struck him in the true depths of his soul. It was a tall and strong Hervé Frassier who put the brakes on the Amok's deadly and criminal race by thumping a fatal blow on his head, as easily as he turned his hands before killing them. From that day onwards, the poor young man had to fend for himself and was forced to go from lie to lie, from flight to flight, in order to emerge unscathed from many dangerous situations for a little boy of just seven years old. Somehow, however, he succeeded over the years in making a place for himself in society. Having a predisposition for service as always wishing to bring pleasure and being silent by nature. He also understood just as quickly that a sweet lie was better than a painful truth. Thus, it was thereby, at an age where innocence and recklessness usually still reign, that the angelic Ernest received his letters from Krakow, as they say in France because indeed the others did not let themselves be fooled by his words, some of his exploits seeming quite exaggerated for his young age. However, being a hard-working and meticulous individual, he was often excused for this tendency. It is besides on a tall story that our dear friend embarked in 1888 at just 16 years old for his very first long trip, undoubtedly the most initiatory and crucial because this crossing would mark a turning point in his nomadic life, which was then without destination. This will lay the foundations of his exile in the British Empire 
from Calais to Dover in the first place, aboard the Empress. The liner was managed by the London, Chatham and Dover Railways, a company known for its dubious punctuality, a fact that Ernest, deceiver by necessity, already held in horror. Yet, a jolt suddenly pulled him out of his torpor. He would later learn that it was the death sound of the fateful instant of the collision with the disastrous iceberg. He did not understand it immediately, his mind still being clouded by his tribulations of the soul, but what he saw on the bridge, and which he thought were incandescent stones, were in fact multiple breaks of ice through which the rays of the moon refracted and gave the illusion of being emitting sources of polar blue light. But surprisingly, instead of alerting him, this spurt immediately threw him even deeper into his buried remembrances. He is now propelled by his memory to the banks of the Seine, in January of the Year of Grace, 1880, only a few months after the terrible bloodbath. In his early youth, life spared our friend little and brought him plethora of misfortunes. Time and time again, he believed he saw his end coming. He could see death and his sigh awaiting him, but the blows of fate meant that he still managed to barely escape. The winter of 1879 was particularly harsh, going down in the annals as the iciest episode of cold ever known to a Parisian. So Siberian that the river froze in December, something never seen before, let alone considerable. Paris under the snow, the Seine taken by ice, completely petrified in time, by time. Who was not thunderstruck at the sight of the Seine, frozen, on the morning of December 10th? A crowd of curious people came indeed to observe with dismay the sad sight of the paralysis of the river artery of Paris. Ernest had then found refuge in the capital with one of his uncles, a cabaret manager. The phenomenon dragged on throughout December, and the locals finally made the situation a festive occasion, improvising makeshift skates and sleds to make the most of this inertia. Our companion took full advantage of it, temporarily regaining a semblance of use. He thus went every day to the expense of ice, in order to find some distraction before starting the sad service which awaited him at night. Stacks and stacks of stained plates, glasses and cutlery would wait for him and steal all his zest for life until the next morning. Without warning, however, the weather had somewhat mellowed during the months of January. Ernest, as he was enjoying himself sliding down the dormant river, was surprised to break its seemingly thick veil. He soon broke through the frost to sink into the freezing water. The cold and its vivacity went through him like blows from a pocket knife, and the pain stabbed him brutally. His breathing suddenly stopped, his lungs unable to fill with the polar air under the weight of shock and distress. However, he owed his salvation only to himself, no one being around at this late of an hour. He finally managed to grab a thick chunk of steel frozen water, used it as a float, and struggled with all the strength he had left towards the ledge, which at that moment seemed almost unattainable. He also recalled that while being on the pass which brought him back to the Swedish warmth of the cabaret a few meters away, he believed he was passing away several times. The cold was attacking him more and more violently, up until he felt he was becoming ice himself. Still aboard the liner though, which had now begun its frantic race towards the abyss, Ernest would only emerge from his chaotic state with a firm tussle of a passenger, wearing a top hat and a matching frock coat. No one on the boat knew his name, and the time that the crossing lasted, everyone gossiped, patrons and staff alike each tapping into their imagination and giving the black-dressed character an incredible journey. Ernest, however, once again, freed himself from the Grim Reaper by the heroic initiative of this mysterious individual. He would indeed save him from the shipwreck by passing him off as a first-class passenger, having made him put on his outfit so that he could get on a lifeboat along with him. Owing his life and situation to him, our faithful Ernest would be forever grateful to this man, whom we will call Le Strige. 
He thus entered his service naturally and would be his most loyal and devoted servant, but also friend, until the end of his days.